Hello there. This lecture covers the basics of what is a theory, what is a construct, and how are constructs operationalized or measured. So I'll start by going over a brief overview of what is the scientific method and then just revisiting independent variables, quasi-independent variables and dependent variables. Then looking at what a construct is and how they are used in theories. And I will show you some examples of theories. And then looking at how constructs can be measured through operational definitions. So remember, this is a big picture of the scientific method, right? And so we're looking at a research idea, identifying variables, literature review and hypotheses. And then the bulk of this lecture is really focused on how you operationalize variables so that you can then collect data, so you can do research. So what we're really focused on would be the method section of a manuscript. And then after you operationalize and collect your data, of course, you want to analyze and interpret that data, test your hypotheses, report your findings, figure out what your findings really mean, what are the practical implications, and then what are some um, ways to do research to follow up with those results. But again, when we think about constructs and operationalization, we're really focused on the method of a study. And then as a quick review, just remembering that independent variables are in experimental research, they are manipulated by the researcher, and they form the basis of different conditions that people in the study will participate in. Then your quasi-independent variable is similar, but it's not manipulated. It's more of a predictor in a model. It's something that's measured as a predictor, but isn't manipulated by the researcher. Quasi-independent variables are measured, not manipulated. Dependent variables are also measured. And again, those are the variables that depend on either the independent variable or the quasi-independent variable in the research. So for example, if you were doing a study to see if interacting with faculty more often increases student sense of belonging, you would have a quasi-independent variable and a dependent variable if you just measured that, right? If you just ask students how often they interact with faculty, that's a quasi-independent variable. You think it's a predictor of sense of belonging, but you didn't manipulate it. But you could do a different study where maybe you actually manipulate how often students interact with faculty. So you could randomly assign a third of students to have one meeting with faculty, another third of students to have three meetings with faculty over the course of the semester, and another group of students to not have any meetings with faculty over the course of the semester. Then you would end up having an independent variable there because the interaction with faculty is directly controlled by and manipulated by the researcher. But in both of these examples, dependent variable would be the student's sense of belonging, which you'd probably measure with um, a Likert scale. And I'll actually show you an example of what those scales can look like. So while some research variables are obvious and well-defined and easily observed and easily measured, others are not. So let's fake focus first on what is easily measurable and then looking at constructs, which are those that aren't necessarily easy to measure. So you may be interested in examining objective characteristics and demographics. So for instance, you may think there's differences in the relationship between faculty interactions and sense of belonging based on sex, ethnicity, age, um, things like that. Some other demographics that are relevant to my research that I look at in industrial organizational psychology would be like salary, job title, how long you've been in an organization, just things that are really straightforward and obvious and objective. Also, observable external behaviors. So behaviors that are easy to quantify and easy to look at without necessarily doing a, you know, a survey or doing a deep measure. So for instance, um, number of arrests, um, number of call offs, maybe hours of sleep and, and grades for students. There's also external stimuli that can be captured and measured and analyzed in research. So for instance, um, if you have a gamification structure in your class where students get incentivized to participate and incentivized to meet with faculty, right? that's an external stimuli. Also, any kinds of rewards that are offered to your research participants, any promises that are being made in their environment. Also, any kind of like if they're in the workplace, any punishments that are um, enacted for missing work or doing things like that. And just really thinking about the environment in general and things that are observable in the environment that may have an effect on the variables in your research. While those things are pretty straightforward, many of the quasi-independent variables and dependent variables in behavioral sciences research 
are not really directly observable through the empirical method, and they involve constructs. So a construct is an unobservable, abstract, internal or subjective type of attitude, perception, or idea. Something that's not directly observable, that's not something that you can see on the outside. So some examples of that would be like job satisfaction or self-esteem or perceived advancement potential, maybe even stress, sense of belonging, like I mentioned earlier, right? that's a construct. You can't witness that and see that. You have to measure it carefully with Likert scales. Um, some other constructs could be like growth mindset, um, intentions to graduate, things like that, that are really internal and, and not as easy to measure. So a theory is developed after many studies yield similar findings. So after a lot of replications happen that yield similar results, you can start to develop a theory, which is more of an overarching explanation for why external variables appear to be consistently related in research. So a theory is kind of the underlying, you know, why do we see the things that we see that are observable? So why are the results reliable across these studies? Theories are hypothetical and subjective because observing why is often impossible to do objectively. But again, it's based on a nice body of past research that shows that things are related in a certain way, and then the theory is trying to explain that. In the behavioral sciences, a theory is a set of statements about the mechanisms underlying a particular behavior that allow researchers to make sense of a body of evidence examining similar independent variables or quasi-independent variables and those dependent variables. And this is so that predictions can be made about future instances of those variables. So these underlying mechanisms or mediators are often those unobservable constructs that require an operationalization, right? So careful design of a quantitative measure that taps into that qualitative construct. So in a lot of theories, you'll see there's an external observable stimulus that then leads to some constructs, some internal thoughts, feelings, perceptions, and ideas. And then those thoughts and feelings and interpretations of that external stimulus then lead out to that external observable behavior. Many theories also account for differences in predictive models with objective participant characteristics and demographics serving as moderators of the effects of stimuli and constructs on external behaviors. So when we talk about moderators, we're talking about something that has an influence on the relationship between the variables. But when we talk about mediators, we're really talking about something that is a go-between, right? X leads to Y leads to Z. And so constructs are usually seen as mediators. It's kind of like the in-between thing that, go, that links the external stimulus to the external behavior. And then again, those objective characteristics and demographics are more like moderators, where the relationship among these variables depends on different characteristics and demographics. So now let's take a look at some examples of theoretical models. So this is a really well-respected and well-used model of work stress from Lazarus in 1991. And this model suggests that stress is like a transaction where the person influences the environment and in turn, the environment influences the person. So Lazarus believed that stress was a result of perceived threat, harm, or challenge and harm is really damage that already occurred, like job loss. A threat could be anticipated harm that makes you feel endangered, defensive, or self-protective. And a challenge is a little different. It's a high demand situation that requires effort. And this type of stress is typically positive. And in the right dose, challenges can also often lead to enthusiastic, engaged, and even more fulfilled employees. So those are kind of the indicators of stress. And then this model suggests that if the person feels that they have a state or something to lose from the harmful, threatening, or challenging situation, then they will consider options for dealing with the stress. So if they feel like they're in control, they are going to use problem-focused coping so they can seek information about what needs to be done and maybe change their behavior or change the environment or both. So again, that problem-focused coping, according to this theory, only arises when the person thinks that they can control the situation through their own efforts. Then you have emotion-focused coping, which kicks in when people feel like they do not have the ability to change their behavior or change the environment. So if you can see here, you'll see that you've got the observable external stimulus, 
and then you have all these constructs in the middle and then you have the external observable behaviors through the way that they cope. So here's another theoretical model example that's related to job insecurity and that I actually helped develop with some of my colleagues back in 2014. So you can see a similar process here, right, where you have those observable characteristics leading to internal processes. So you've got socioeconomic conditions, which could be like layoff events or national and local unemployment rates, just economic and occupational forecasts. Like they say, there's a recession coming, oh no. Then you've got your organizational characteristics, which is like how well the organization is performing. Was there a formal announcement of layoffs? Is there an upcoming merger or acquisition or organizational restructuring and downsizing? And then these can lead to perceptions of job insecurity and job loss, which then results in some of those internal reactions. And then that can lead to another construct, which is employee well-being, right? Not something that's directly observable, kind of tricky to measure. And then that leads to those observable behavioral outcomes, which can include a lot of different things. Um, some of those behavioral outcomes could be like performance related or if they stay at the organization, um, things like that. And then in this model, like the other one, it's kind of a cyclical process where those employee behaviors will lead to organizational well-being, which will then feed back into the organizational characteristics. So just another example of a theory. Here's another theory example that comes from IO psychology, just because that's my field of expertise. And this is actually my favorite model in industrial organizational psychology, because it does give um, employers an opportunity to think about the dimensions of the job that are pretty controllable and how that relates to employee psychological states and outcomes. So according to the job characteristics model, organizations that have more variety, so employees are allowed to do more things and are allowed to, you know, flex their skills, so to speak. Also employees that have more task identity, so they're seeing the product through from beginning to end, or they're seeing their patients from beginning to end, and they're seeing the outcomes of their work, not just working on an assembly line and doing one little piece, but they actually see everything from start to finish. And employees that have high levels of task significance, so feeling like the work that they do is really meaningful and important to the organization, tend to have more perceived meaningfulness of work. Then peep employees who have more autonomy, they're given the freedom to do their job the way that they see fit, tend to feel more responsible for outcomes. And employees who are given more feedback and told you know, if they're doing well or not doing well and given information about how to do a better job or continue doing a good job, they tend to have better knowledge of results. And all of these states lead to these really important outcomes of motivation, performance, satisfaction, absenteeism, and turnover. So let me take a quick moment to go through here and kind of highlight what the constructs would be in this model, just to help you get a better understanding of what a construct is. So in this case, I would say that anything that's a perception or an idea or an internal thing is gonna be a construct. So skill variety is probably something that could be objective. You could ask people's bosses to rate how many different skills they use and they could even do that as well. Task identity, so you could really objectively analyze a job to see if employees are seeing the full process. But task significance is probably more internal. That's something that is a construct that you would really need to, to measure, to tap into. Do they feel like their work is meaningful and significant? Same with autonomy. It's really people's perception of how much freedom they have to do their job that matters. So I would call that a construct. Now feedback could be measured as a construct where you ask people to how much feedback do they perceive that they get or you could have it be more objective where the you know the bosses indicate the types of feedback and how often they receive it. Now the rest of this in the psychological states these are all construct. So you would want to measure these with a survey to figure out how they're feeling about their job. Also some of these outcomes, some of these aren't really behavioral observable outcomes. So looking at intrinsic motivation, that's more of a construct, job satisfaction. But then when we look at performance, absenteeism and turnover, depending on how performance is measured, these could be more objective and observable outcomes, right? So 
what was their performance evaluation score recently, or how many sales did they make, whatever makes sense for performance. Absenteeism is very straightforward, so how many times have they missed work? And then turnover is also something, did they quit or did they stay? So here's my final theory example. They'll be really relevant to all my students out there. So this is looking at dropout intentions. So what makes the difference between students staying in school and dropping out? And according to this model, we've got a lot of constructs here. Um, so we have previous academic performance is not a construct and early ac academic performance isn't because you could look at that very straightforward with a GPA or grades. But here we've got perceived social isolation. That is a construct. That's something that's internal and more qualitative than quantitative. Also perceived social support, which in this model would be our quasi independent variables because they're not being manipulated, they're being measured. And then these lead to our mediator of sense of belonging, which is also a construct. So according to their model, those that feel more isolated have less sense of belonging and those that feel less I have more social support tend to have more sense of belonging and then that sense of belonging according to this model leads to engagement which is also a construct and then also leading to dropout intention which in this case is a construct because we have to measure their intentions it's an internal characteristic it's not that they drop out or not which would be more observable so you can see here this model again is having these predictors, these quasi-independent variables that lead to these kind of mediators in the middle and then lead to our outcome, our, our dependent variable of dropout intention. So stop and think for a second what it would take to measure dropout intentions or to measure sense of belonging, right? It's not an easy process. And you can't just ask people, do you have a sense of belonging or do you not have a sense of belonging? Because they may not know necessarily what you're trying to tap into and what you mean by that. So it's really, really important to operationalize constructs in a very specific way so that not only do the participants in your research know what you're trying to measure, but when you go to analyze the data, you know that the scores for these different measures are equivalent and that we're tapping into the same thing for all of the participants. That they're not just everybody had a different idea of what sense of belonging was. No, no, no. You create a survey to measure it, to operationalize it, to make sure that you have specific items that tap into all the facets of sense of belonging that you care about. And I'll show you some examples of those here in a little bit. So an operational definition is when you operationalize a construct and you're basically just clearly defining and indirectly measuring those constructs. So you're really measuring the external manifestations of underlying attitudes, perceptions, or ideas. When you operationalize a construct, you're going to quantify that construct and you're quantifying it, meaning that you're turning it into something that can be measured with a number. You can also operationalize not just constructs that you're measuring, but also the logistics of an experimental manipulation. So maybe you um, want to see if participants behave differently in stressful versus not stressful environments. And so you manipulate stress, so you have a stressful environment, which is where the, the researcher is really rude and demanding to the research participants. And you have another condition that's a calm environment, where the researcher is kind and, and chill with the participants. So you are operationalizing stress by the way that the participants are being treated by the researcher. So you can operationalize things that are measured, and you can also operationalize manipulations of independent variables. So when it go, comes to measuring constructs with quantitative survey measures, it's critical that you consult past research. Don't just make items up on your own. As you'll see when we talk about reliability and validity of survey measures, a lot of attention to detail and a lot of expertise goes into developing these survey scales. So the best way to construct a survey is to tap into past research through academic peer-reviewed scholarly journal articles and find the measures that they used. And you might notice if you're doing this on your own that finding those measures can be really difficult. You'll find a great manuscript that has really interesting results and you'll go to the measures section and they'll mention what measures they use but they never provide the items. But what you can do if that happens is you can look at the citation in the measure section of the article and then go find that reference in the article and find the source article for the measure. Oftentimes that's where you'll actually get the survey items. 
But if they didn't include them either, even in the article they published about developing the measure, you can usually email the first author and they'll send you a copy of the measure because they want people to use it. So just keeping in mind that these are based on empirically validated scales from past research, not just items that I came up with. And that's why you see a citation there. So this is a measure of peer support in terms of sense of belonging in college. And you can look at these items and see that having a multi-item empirically validated scale is much more useful than just saying, do you feel supported by your peers, yes or no? These type of scales will give you the ability to really tap into it and refine it and know exactly what people had in mind when they were responding to these questions. And from an analytic perspective, when you go to analyze this data, you're not gonna look at each item separately. What you do is you create a mean scale score for each person, and that mean scale score is basically just the average of all the items that they responded to here. So you would have an overall mean scale score for peer support, sense of belonging, and that's what you would plug into a data analysis. So now I wanna show you that sense of belonging, not only do you need multiple items to tap into it, but peer support isn't the only type of sense of belonging. Hoffman published several subscales of sense of belonging that tap into various aspects of it. So now let's look at another type of sense of belonging for students. So here's another subscale of sense of belonging that's empirically validated by Hoffman and uh, Hoffman's colleagues. And you can see now this is tapping into faculty support and comfort, right? So feeling comfortable seeking help from a teacher, feeling comfortable asking for help if you don't understand course related material and different things like that. So you can take a moment to kind of look at those items. Again, noticing that if you just ask people, do you feel supported by faculty? That's not as useful as measuring it in this detailed way. We're operationalizing these constructs well. So here are some items from that same survey scale that tap into sense of belonging in terms of classroom comfort. So do you feel okay speaking in class and feel comfortable volunteering your ideas and contributing to class discussions and asking questions in class? Again, much better than just being like, hey, do you feel comfortable in class? Now you can see the scale for sense of belonging of isolation. So looking at, is it difficult to meet other students? No one in my class knows anything personal about me. I rarely talk to other students and I know very few people in my classes. Notice that the way this is scored, more agreement across the board is going to result in higher scores here. And that's because all of these items are indicative of a stronger sense of belonging. So that higher scores mean more belonging. Here's another subscale of sense of belonging, which is empathetic faculty understanding. So this is really not just looking at faculty support, but do faculty really care about you? Are they sensitive to your unique needs? And again, higher scores mean more empathetic faculty understanding. So now we're taking a look at a totally different uh, sub or totally different empirically validated survey scale. And this one's looking at mental health. And I want you to notice that the coding is a little different for the first item. So you see how much of the time have you felt lonely? That's indicative of less mental health. So when you go to create your mean scale score for this survey, you're gonna code the responses this way so that higher numbers still mean more mental health. So never in this case would be indicative of more mental health, right? Because you're not feeling lonely. So that's why you flip the scoring here so that higher scores mean more mental health and lower scores, right, always feeling lonely are indicative of less mental health. But if you look at the remaining items after the first one, you'll see that they all indicate stronger mental health, more positive outcomes. So you'll notice that the way those are scored, they're on that one to five scale with five being always and one being never, because in those cases, higher scores do mean more mental health, right? So saying always means you have more mental health. So just keeping in mind that we use mean scale scores multi-item empirically validated survey scales, and that you need to reverse code any survey items that are listed in the opposite way of the construct. So if they're indicative of less of what you're measuring, then you would flip the scoring there. So finally, just to emphasize, operationalizing constructs is not easy, but it is worth the effort. And just remember that when you're doing research, it helps to identify which variables are constructs that you need to find those empirically validated measures for and which variables are either automatically collected data or data that's directly empirically observable. 
Then again, remember to consult past research to get those empirically validated multi-item survey scales and be careful with reverse coding for those negatively worded questions so the mean scale score that you generate in your data isn't messed up. In another lecture, I'll explain to you something called Cronbach's alpha, and that's a really useful measure for looking at the internal consistency of items, and that measure can help you realize if you forgot to reverse code something. Reverse coding isn't just there to make things more complicated. It's really a great way to make sure that participants are paying attention. So if you see that they're giving fives across the board and some of those items are the opposite worded, right, they're negatively worded, then that means they're probably not paying attention to the survey. So it's also kind of a nice way using those, you know, flipped items and those negatively worded um, survey scales to make sure that people are paying attention. So I hope you feel like you're ready to operationalize some constructs and you have a better understanding of how constructs are used in theories.